We're in this series, a Christmas, a three-week series that the Lord has given to me called Words of Christmas. And the reason I put Words of Christmas because it's specific words from different people from the story of Christmas. Last week, we talked to you about Words of Mary. When Mary heard the news that she was pregnant with the Christ child, the angel visited her. And it was going to mess her life up and redefine her life. What was her response? Her response was, let it be to me according to your word. Let it be to me, Lord. I want my life redefined. I want to be more like you. I want to be everything you've called me to be. Well, the story continues today in Luke chapter 2. About nine months later, Mary and Joseph were called and they had to go to Bethlehem because there was a census being taken and they were to register. They say got there and they got there a little late perhaps and every motel, hotel, inn, everything, every place to stay was booked up. The only place they had was a barn, a stable. And so they go into the stable and they make their bed. And wouldn't you know it? Baby decides to come now. They're right on time, aren't they? And here comes the baby and she gives birth. According to the word of God, according to history, according to the prophecies, she gives birth and lays the baby in a manger. And the Bible says, and she brought forth her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling cloths, laid him in a manger. Because there was no room for them in the inn. Verse 8 says, Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. <laughs> Why shepherds? You ever wondered that? I don't know. My mind just thinks weird things sometimes. As I'm reading this, why did God go to the shepherds first? Hey, I don't know. What's the big deal about the shepherds? Well, let me give you a little bit of a, a background here. You see, shepherds were despised by the orthodox, the religious people, the people that did everything by rules and by regulations, and they had it laid out. And the shepherds were despised because they were unable to keep the details of the ceremonial law. They couldn't wash their hands all the time. They, 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 they were out in the field. They couldn't follow the other rules that they were supposed to follow because the flocks demanded their time. And they were out in the field all the time with those sheep. They were simply hard-working men. Now, the Orthodox looked down on them because they didn't do things in the proper, normal way. Isn't that just like Jesus to go to people that doesn't do things in the proper, normal way. He was born in a stable. He didn't come as a king, as most people would think, but he came in a stable. <laughs> he shattered the orthodox way, the religions of the world. He shatters it. But he goes to these shepherds, you see, because God chose lowly shepherds. To send the salvation message first. And by the way, they understood what it meant to do lamb sacrifices too because they raised them. They cared for them. They took care of them. So they understood. God still chooses the simple, the forgotten, hardworking, unorthodox people of today. Aren't you thankful for that? I mean, look around you in this room today. A lot of unorthodox people, right? We're all just a bunch of motley crew here. But God has chosen us. God loves us. God has ordained us. God wants us. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> well, this night, these shepherds' lives were changed completely. Redefined, if you will. Their future was not going to be the same. They were going to look at their problems differently. They were going to look at their lives differently. They were going to look at their marriages differently. They were going to look at all the issues that they would face in the future differently because of this one night that happened. Today, your eyes can be open to a whole new world. A whole new world of discovery and spiritual things. A new outlook at how you handle things in the future. 
life's problems, life's difficulties. The rest of the story goes like this from Luke chapter 2 verses 9 through 20. Listen to this. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them. Now get this picture. They're standing out in the middle of a field. It's dark. Probably stars out. It's a night like every other night. And all of a sudden this angel comes down and stands before them. Okay. <laughs> And the glory of the Lord shone around them, the Bible says, and they were greatly afraid. Seems like whenever God shows up, we get greatly afraid. <laughs> then the angel said to them, don't be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God, saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill towards men. Can you get this picture here? They're in the middle of nowhere. And first the angel comes, and the glory of the Lord comes. And then all of a sudden, a host of angels come. Those poor shepherds, they've never seen anything like this before in their life. It shook them, I'm sure. They're like, what is this? Can you imagine this? And they're like, wake me up, am I dreaming? You see, let me point this out to you. There was an encounter, a host of angels. <laughs> there was this encounter that they had. Then there was this encouragement. The angels said, chill out. Because what I'm here today to do is to give you peace. I'm here to tell you that the Savior of the earth is born. The one that you've been waiting for for many, many years has come. So they got good news. But then there was an invitation. He says, you'll find him. If you go to Bethlehem, you'll find him. He's in a manger wrapped in cloths, swaddling cloths, just a bunch of cloths. In a manger. So there was this invitation. The angel said, look, you can go see him. Look, you can find him. Just go. Now here's my thoughts on this story today. My thoughts are this. There are many people today in our country, probably in this church, who have had amazing spiritual encounters. How many of you can remember when you gave your life to Jesus? Raise your hand. Can you remember that day? How many of you have this, this experience with Christ that you will always remember for the rest of your life? Most of us do. That defining moment when you said, yes, Lord. See, most people that call themselves believers have had this encounter. We found encouragement in Christ, haven't we? We found encouragement that time at the altar that we knew for a moment, hey, everything's going to be all right. We have hope with Jesus. Amen. And then it seems to stop there a lot of times. We overlook the invitation to find Jesus in all things. We stop at that one time experience. We stop at that moment of salvation we stop there. Someone has misled us. We have been turned off. We get too busy with life. Something happens and we just stop pursuing Jesus in everything that we do. I want you to notice the shepherd's words this morning. Listen to the shepherd's words. Verse 15 says, after all has happened, the angels left. <laughs> and listen to what the shepherd's response was. Let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. Let us now go to Bethlehem. Let us now pursue Jesus. Bethlehem to you and I is recognizing our Savior's peace and good in all things. It's recognizing Jesus when we're having that family quarrel. 
It's recognizing that Jesus has a better way when we are fussing and fighting in our homes. It's recognizing that Christ has a better way of managing our finances. It's recognizing that God has a better way of living in every situation. So we have to go to Bethlehem in all things. See, we too have this open invitation to go to Bethlehem to pursue Jesus, the Savior, the healer, Amen. the answer. Amen. Okay? Now that's my thought on that. But see, many are satisfied with just the in angelic experience and never go to Bethlehem to find Jesus. I got to thinking, what would have happened if those shepherds would have said, wow, that was interesting, and just gone back to work? Wow, that was an experience. Wow, we saw that. Did that really happen? Wow. And they just gone back to their life as it was. See, many people do this today in church. We find Jesus. The announcement is made to us. But we just keep going back to our own lifestyle. Doing the same old things, the same old way. Not pursuing, not going to Bethlehem. <laughs> you know what? We can hear the message of the cross. We can hear it. We can hear it in many, many ways. Or we can experiencing, experience Him in everything we do. Amen. Every part of our life. Amen. You can hear the message. You can hear the Word of God. You can come and hear pastor preach. Or you can experience Jesus every day, every part of your life, Amen. in every situation in your life. Why do we settle for just an angelic experience? Why do we settle for just a, a, a wonderful time? You know, we can live this way, church. We get distracted. We get discouraged. We get disillusioned. Somewhere between our encounter and pursuit, we stop. So I want to talk to you about the pursuit of Jesus. I want to give you three thoughts this morning about the shepherd's words. Let's look at these guys. What they did, what they said, and what they did. And if you want to pursue Jesus in every part of your life this morning, in every way, listen to this word. Number one, stop and prioritize. When you're facing overwhelming odds... When you're facing wonderful blessings in this life, when you're facing big decisions, when you're facing all the things that we face in this world today, stop and prioritize Jesus. Look what they did. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. They didn't waste any time. They adjusted their schedules Move with urgency to find Jesus. The peace, the good news. That's what they wanted to hear. We, we must respond to the invitation the ur with urgency. That invitation with urgency, the cry for Jesus that's in our lives, with the cry for Jesus that's in our kids, the cry for Jesus that's in our marriage, the cry for Jesus that's in our pain around us every day. And that cry is there. There's a cry. I need hope. I need answers. I need healing. I, I want help. I want help. How do we respond? So we have to stop and prioritize. Yes, church, your time is required to learn so that you can teach your children God's Word. Yes, your time is required so that you can learn, so that you can heal your broken relationship, your marriages. Yes, there is an urgent cry and there your time will be required to learn how to talk and lead others to Bethlehem. 
Not to mention learning about God, learning about money, learning about health. You see, we get so distracted. We get so busy. We get moving in one direction and, and we get so overwhelmed with things that we don't stop and remember what our priorities are. And that priority is Jesus. Amen. Amen. It's not the flock of sheep. It was Jesus. Amen. Let me go because I need to go get the good news. I need to go get some answers. I need to go get God's will and then I can come back and take care of my sheep. Stop and prioritize. Your time adjustment is required. If you are too busy to find Jesus, you're sowing the wrong seeds and you will reap a faithless crop. It's what's happening in our schools. It's what's happening in America. We're taking Jesus out of everything. We're sowing corrupt seed. And listen to the word of God. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For if he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. Which starts right here. So stop and prioritize. When you're in the heat of that argument at home, call time out. Go to Bethlehem. Find some answers. Find some hope. You know, when you're in the middle of making that big, huge decision before you purchase that ridiculous amount for that car, stop. Go to Bethlehem. Find the answers. You, you know, before you decide on anything, we need to stop. Before we listen to what the doctor says about our health and how we're going to die. Oh man, have you watched the commercials today? They give these side effects of all these commercials. Have you ever listened to those things? Yes. My gosh, one of them said, and death. Before we listen to anybody, listen to Jesus. Before we make decisions, listen to Jesus. Before we hear the doctor's diagnosis, let's listen to Jesus' diagnosis. Stop and prioritize. We need to go to Bethlehem, just like the shepherds. Number two, second thought I have with these shepherds is they shared their experience. We need to share our experience. Share our experience. Look, listen to this. Verse 17 and 18 says, Now when they had seen him... They made widely known the saying which was told them concerning the child. And all those who heard it marveled at those things which were told them by the shepherd. Do you share what Jesus has done in your life? Do you share? You want to pursue Jesus? Start talking him up. You want, to share, you, want to, you want to pursue Christ in your life and in your home? Start making Him the conversation at your dinner table. Talk Him up. Start looking at what He's done, what He's going to do. Start looking at what the Scripture says He will do. You see, if we're all satisfied at the encounter, we will never experience all the joys of the Lord. And the more that you apply the gospel, the word of God, to your life, and you recognize Jesus in everything you do, the more that you're going to want to share him. Are, are, do you understand this today? Let, let me give you a scripture here. Paul writes, I pray that you may be active in sharing your faith. So that you will have a full understanding of every good thing we have in Christ. Amen. We change lives by sharing our encounter. That's right. Amen. We change people by talking about Jesus. You, we, we, were too, we get too worried about what people think. Well, I don't want to just come off too hard on them like some... Like some religious fanatic. Why not? I like what Shirley says. Shirley says, people are going to hell unless you tell them not to. 
That's true. And it's that simple. (laughs) Talk it up. You know, if you're in love, how many of you guys remember when you were first in love? You guys remember that? Iris does. Nobody else does. Okay. You know, you remember that, that hot chick that, that, that you found or that, that handsome dude that you found. Man, you couldn't wait to hear their voice. You couldn't wait to tell somebody about them. You couldn't wait to talk about that hunk of a man you had. Notice I said you had life changes. Okay. All right. <laughs> you know. But you couldn't wait. And you're all excited. And, 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 and you're in love. And you're growing in this love because you're spending time with them. And you're, you're, you're telling everybody about them. Gosh, even on Facebook they say, so-and-so's in a relationship. <laughs> yeah, I want to do that. And, and that's the way it is with Jesus. If you're really in love with him, if you really, really understand what the good news is all about, what, what, what his favor is all about, you know what? We want to tell people. Amen. Amen. We want to share him, what he's done. You know what I've learned? I've learned you start positive and you start talking him up. You know what? It gets his attention. He loves it when we start to do that. Besides that, we change lives by sharing our encounter. You know what? I get tired of hearing people say, well, we need to pray. Just need to pray. We, we just need to pray. That's people's Christians' answers to everything. Just need to pray. I agree we need to pray. I agree. And we need to pray more and harder and more effectively. We just come through a month of prayer. But I want to tell you something. We need to take action. We need to be responsible. We need to work like it depends on us. Pray like it depends on God. We need to take action and be responsible. You know what? My family's falling apart. I need to pray. You need to do more than prayer. You need to get in the Word with your family and learn what the Scriptures say. You need to take your family and be in charge and say, we're not going to be this way. We're going to follow Christ. Let's take an action. You know what? We can complain about the schools all we want, but how many of us are involved with it? We can complain about our community all we want, but how many of us are getting involved, sharing our experience and doing something to change lives in the community? Thank God for the women the other day. They went out in this community here and passed out door hangers. That's so cool. We've had one phone call, and then the other day I got one through the door. Somebody slid it through the door of a prayer request. So, Pam, it works. You know what? You don't know what to do. Well, do something. That's an awesome thing. So, yeah, we need to pray. We need to pray hard. And we need to pray in spirit. We need to pray in tongues. We need to pray every way we can. But faith without works is dead. God uses us. God uses us. The shepherds didn't just say, well, we just need to pray about going to Bethlehem. <laughs> We just need to pray about telling people about what we experienced. They might think we're crazy. We saw this angels just all over the place singing. And they're going to say, you crazy, unorthodox shepherds. You're out in the field. You, you're crazy. What are you smoking? Are you ready to put yourself on the line? See, that's what they did. They went through telling everybody, this is what we saw. This is what happened. And you know what? That's when the word started to get out. And the word got around. And there was rumors going on. People talking because those crazy shepherds can happen in your life as well. Share the experience. Number three. Number three and finally. 
Live the hope. Live the hope. Look what happened in verse 20. It says, Then the shepherds returned, going back to their fields, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told to them. Wow. They returned back to their, their lives praising, worshiping God because now they had hope. Now they weren't complaining about those dumb sheep. Now they were ready to go back because they had hope in Jesus Christ. We don't have to gripe and complain about our workplaces. We don't have to gripe and complain about where we live when we know our Savior, when we have the hope that He gives us. Because we know that He answers prayer. Because we know that He will use us to change the circumstances. Because we know our Savior lives. The shepherds... To the shepherds, this was confirmation of all the promises of God. All the Old Testament now was being revealed. Salvation, peace, goodwill towards all men. Pretty amazing. Favor, hope was now with you. <laughs> I've been reading through Hebrews. I just finished actually. And I got to the part, the first few chapters of Hebrews, where it talks about God's rest. God's rest. He's not talking about death. He's talking about God wants His blessings and favor on you even on this earth. Right. It's amazing. Chapter 3 was powerful. God's rest. That was His will for His children all along. But they refused to live by faith. They refused to live in hope. And so, what happened? He had ended up destroying a whole generation in the wilderness. Because they were negative. They were critical. They complained constantly. Oh, I'm praying every day, God, change me with that. I don't want to complain. I don't want to be negative. I don't want to be critical, Lord. You see, those are seeds from a hopeless heart. You hear somebody criticizing, you hear somebody being negative, you hear somebody complaining, there's hopelessness in their heart. Each day is filled with God's favor, church. Amen. That's why Jesus came, to give us favor. And each day is filled with that. We don't need to be griping and complaining and criticizing. In all things, the Bible says, give praise. Rejoice again, I say. Rejoice. And if we could turn our criticisms and negativity and complaining into praise, wow, that's living hope. That's, right, that's, right. that's living hope. Take some discipline. I read this scripture in Hebrews. But Christ, the faithful son, was in charge of the entire household. And we are God's household. If we keep up our courage and remain confident in our hope in Christ. There's a responsibility there. The responsibility is, guess what? It takes work right. to keep your hope. Right. It takes work to stay courageous. Amen. Amen. You have to work at it. Not because you feel like it. I don't always feel like being hopeful. Okay? But take the thought captive in your mind and say, but no, I've been to Bethlehem. I know. My Savior lives. My Savior's alive. And no matter what I'm facing, I'm going to come out on top because of Jesus. Hope is a choice that we are to make each day of our lives. That we find Jesus in every situation. His will in our lives. His favor. And that's what the shepherds knew. They understood that. Number one, God hears your prayers. God has started the answer to your prayers. It's on the way, church. So don't doubt Him. 
And I want you to understand he wants us to be responsible. I'm, I'm excited for the future of this wonderful church. What God is going to do. What God has done. So what are we to do with all this today? We've got to go to Bethlehem. And we've got to go to Bethlehem more than just once. We've got to go to Bethlehem. How do we do that? How do we pursue Jesus? Number one, we stop and prioritize. Some of you need a time out in your home right now. Some of you need a time out in your finances right now. Some of you need a time out in the way you're thinking about your health right now. Number two, we share what God has done. We begin to talk about His wonderful works. We, we, we begin to praise Him for what He has done, church. How often do we thank God for one day and then we move on? But we need to praise Him every day. Because He's brought us this far. Because He'll take you on further. Because that's His will. And third, we need to live the hope. Live the hope that we have in Him. Our whole dispositions need to change sometimes. Our whole countenance. Our whole way of thinking. Every day, ask God to correct your thinking and line it up with Him. Because He thinks so much different than we do. He works in so many ways different than we think. He's powerful. He's an awesome God. So, like the shepherds, we too can discover God's healing hand and hope. You're not too far gone. Your marriage isn't too far gone. Your finances isn't too far gone. <laughs> you know? We can... Find hope in all circumstances. But we have to go to Bethlehem to find Jesus. Whatever you are facing today in your life, stop. Stop what you're doing and go to Bethlehem. Take a time out. Say, Lord, I just need your will. I need to inquire of you. And it all starts by being submissive to what He wants for your life. It all starts by saying, Lord, redefine me. Lord, recharge re me. I want your will, not mine. 